friends um welcome to the purpose driven life uh program that we've been doing for the past um 23 days now um remember what we're doing we are reviewing this book the purpose driven life by rick warren now we call it a new life because the whole idea is by the time we're done with this program we will all have achieved a brand new life, a brand new way of seeing things. And just a quick recap on last chapter, which was chapter 23. He said, nothing shapes your life more than the commitment to, you choose to make. Your commitments can develop you or they can destroy you. But either way, they will define you. So what you commit yourself to is what we're talking about here. That's what makes you who you eventually become. And one of the things he said was, if you tell him what you're committed to, he can tell you what you'll be in a few years' time or a longer year's time. So we committed to making this work by finishing it. And from the things we've seen so far, especially from my side, I know that it's absolutely making a lot of sense. One of the other things that also touched my understanding was something about the, the thoughts that come into our head. It says to change your life, you must change the way you think. Behind everything you do is a thought. And so to change your life, you must, you must um, change the way you're thinking. So this book is helping us to reshape the way we think. And there was something about when the caterpillar changes, it becomes a butterfly. So the thoughts are inside us. And it's the thoughts that determines what we do. And it's from the action we take that our life begins to span out. So that just says to me, we're definitely going to get something out of this. We're definitely going to have a new life out of this. And um, personally, there's a lot that I've been picking out since I started reading this book. So welcome on board and we're going to start today um, on page, not page, uh, on chapter 24, which is day 24. Again, a big thank you to everybody who's following us on this journey. From the YouTube views, we see that a lot of people are really, really looking forward to it. People are watching it. People are making comments. People are being touched so far. So I am so, so happy with that. The whole idea of starting this was really to touch people's lives and touch my life. And I'm so glad that that's happening and that makes me feel really good. If nothing else, it's the, the purpose has been achieved. Touching people's lives, helping us to change some of the things in our life that we were struggling with. So today's chapter says transformed by truth. That's what the, cha the title of the, the chapter is, transformed by truth. So usually we start um with the with the with the verses that he gives us to read which are usually like a meditation something you think about at your own spare time he says people need more than bread for their life and i remember there's a passage in the bible that says man shall not live by bread alone so people need more than bread for their life they must feed on every word of god so word of god feeds us and you remember we're saying if we change the way we think we change our life so we need those words to feed us and it's from that feeding feeding the way we think that we begin to act differently so this is matthew chapter 4 verse 4 and the next verse he gives us is god's gracious word can make you into what he wants you to be and give you everything you could possibly need. God's gracious word can make us into what he wants us to be and give us everything that we could possibly need. It's all about the word that we're dealing with today. Um, in our discussion, because this is a discussion, I'm the one just reading it, but we're discussing, is if there's anything touching your life, anything um, you've experienced from all the various chapters we've touched on so far, please feel free to question us, chat with us, uh, give us a big shout out. We're, we're happy to shout out um, with, with you as well. 
and um, we'll try and make it very interactive very you know exciting fun field and it's not looking like it's just me sitting out here and reading to you so we're gonna start now um the last verse i gave was acts acts of the apostle um, chapter 20 verse 32 so the truth transforms us remember transformed by truth the, the truth transforms us spiritual growth is a process of replacing lies with truth truth replacing lies with the truth jesus prayed sanctify them by the truth your word is truth so that's what jesus said sanctify them by the truth your word is truth so sanctification requires relationship uh, revelation sanctification requires revelation Revelation means opening up something, revealing something. So the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us like the Son of God. He uses the Word of God. So when we get the Word of God feeding us, we are beginning to be like the Son of God. To become like Jesus, we must fill our lives with His Word. We must fill, fill our lives with His Word. So we want to be like Jesus, then we have to fill it fill our lives with his word. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. From the word, the word that we're gonna be taking on, we're then shaped the way God wants us to be. So God's word is unlike any other word. There's no other word that's like God's word. It is alive, God's word is alive. Remember, you will need more than bread to be alive. Bread is your daily food, everything you eat, because we think the only way we can be alive is to eat food through the mouth. We put food in our mouth and we eat it. We are more than just food. The word is what's going to feed us and make us alive. So here is telling us God's word is unlike any other word and it is alive because it's our daily living. That's what it is. Jesus said, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. So remember, in us is the spirit. The spirit is what moves us. So the words that he's given to us is the spirit. And it is what keeps us alive. And it gives us life. So when God speaks, things change. When God speaks to us, things change. Remember, we're trying to change our life. Remember, we want a new life. So when God speaks to us, he changes us. Everything around us, all of creation exists because God said so. Remember the beginning in the Bible, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Everywhere in the Bible, all of Genesis, where God was speaking, everything is, let us create man in our image. So it was always words, and those words are life. He spoke it all into existence. So everything we are, God spoke into existence. That's exactly what the, Bible, the Genesis just told us. How he said, let there be light and there was light. Um, let's create man in our image. In the beginning, he was speaking and things were coming into existence. So without God's word, we would not even be alive. Extremely true. Without God saying, let there be life, light, there would not have been any light. Let, let, let's create man in our image. There would not have been man existing. So James pointed out, God decided to give us life through the word of truth. So we might be the most important of all the things he had made. James said that. So again, remember, we are people watching us live on Instagram. Please feel free to chat with us. We are open to chat with you. Bible is more than a doctrinal book. God's word generates life, creates faith, produces change, frightens the devil, causes miracles, heals the heart, builds character, transforms circumstances, impacts joy, overcomes a di a diversity, defeats temptation, infuses hope, releases power, cleanses our mind, brings things into being, guarantees our future forever. These are all the things that God's word does. And that's why I said God's word is life. 
Because if all these things can happen once we hear God's word, then that confirms that his word is life. Someone who is hurt. It builds characters. Remember, we've been told that one of the biggest things God wants from us is for us to build, is to help us build our character here on earth so that we use that character for eternity. So his word helps to do that. Transform circumstances. So whatever this circumstance, no matter how dark it was, when you hear God's words, it gives you that. It impacts joy. It makes you happy. All that sadness that you've been dealing with, once you've heard some certain words, you're alive. It overcomes adversity. It defeats temptation. When you feel you're going to be, you know, you find you're being tempted to do something that you didn't want to do, and you remind yourself some certain verses, you stop. It infuses hope. It gives you hope for the future. Okay, this is happening to me now, but I don't know how I'm going to overcome this. And then you hear certain words, and there's hope. So it releases power. So if you felt weak and lost, and I tell you, there's so many passages I've taken on in the past. I actually have a book here. Um, one time I did go to Nigeria, and I was sitting on my own and just reading my Bible. And all of this place, I was just passages were just coming to me and I was just reading them and whenever I read something that made sense boom it would just hit me and bring me hope you know some like Ecclesiastes um, chapter 2 verse 17 to 26 vanity upon vanity equals to vanity so it just reminds you that okay whatever these things are that we chase in the world they all come to nothing so why am I doing it and so once you've got that hope has come you suddenly realize you shouldn't be dealing with this or that's also taking you away from temptation because let's say you were going to do something and you realize okay this is really going nowhere it's not taking me anywhere boom you stop and so there's another one psalm 90 um verse 10 12 to 14 our days here uh, may come to 70 or 80. that's where i got that i thought oh my goodness so there it is we're not going to be here forever. This is, we've been given a fixed time here. And look at it. And so when you read things and you start, it start to make sense to you, that's what this passage is saying. That God's word generates life. So everything we're reading here is giving us something. That's what life is. And remember we said our thoughts is what helps us to act. And so the big thing I've been, you know, if you follow me on Facebook, this is where I've been really getting, my head is like everywhere, I'm beginning to try and make sense of it. We need, whatever we think is what we become. So what's creating our thoughts? That's a big question we need to ask ourselves. Where are we feeding our thoughts from? And so if our thoughts is fed from the Bible, from the, the kind of thing I've just read to you here and from what he's saying to us here. Now we're not going to be worried where our thoughts are coming from. Because what we expose our mind to is what feeds our thoughts. And so if our mind has been exposed to things that are not healthy, we will end up having unhealthy thoughts. And if our minds have been exposed to things that are healthy, like things in the Bible, our thoughts will be healthy and our lives will be healthy. See how they are all connecting. So we cannot live without the word of God. Simple. And so anybody who's, which I know there are so many, so many people who say to you, I don't believe in God and this is my person and this is who I am and all that. You watch them most of the time. They might think they are just okay. But when the time comes, they remember. They remember, yes, there is God. There was a lady I remember very well um, and she had... Uh, um, um, uh, ovarian cancer and I can't remember if it was ovarian cancer but it, she had cancer and she was this huge atheist I don't believe in God or I don't know what they're talking about until she then had that illness and suddenly she wanted her children to be baptized she wanted her children to be sent to church because now she's realized that there is some source there is a source that created her and so last minute she now realized so why do we wait until last minute and then we realize that we actually do need our creator to support us, to guide us through difficult times? So we cannot live without the word of God and we should never take it for granted. We should never take the word of God for granted. That's what we're being told here. So we should consider it 
as essential to our life as the food we eat. So the food goes through our mouth, but where he was telling us in the first place where he says, we need more than bread for life. Man shall not live by bread alone. That's again another passage that gives us hope because bread goes through our mouth. But now he's telling us we don't need just bread. We need more than bread. And so we should see God's words as food. Absolutely spot on. Job said, I have treasured the word of his mouth more than my daily bread. I think that noise, I'm not liking it. Clip, clip, clip. Sorry about that. Um, he said, I have treasured the word of his mouth more than my daily bread. So God has, um, Job treasured the word of God more than the food he was eating because God's words were really filling him up with hope. God's words is the spiritual nourishment we need. Um, we must have to fulfill our purpose. So we need God's word to help us fulfill who we are on this earth. The Bible is called our milk, bread, solid food, and our dessert. So the Bible, so I brought my Bible here today. That's my big Bible. And there's a book here that I use in noting down all the things that I'm writing. But we'll get to that. It, that Bible is called our milk, our bread, the solid food we eat, and then the dessert that we have. The four, 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 four square meal or whatever, four course meal. So it says this four course meal is the spirit's menu for spiritual growth and strength and growth. So we need this to give us spiritual growth and strength and our regular growth in life, like how we normally get on with our daily life. So Peter advises us, crave pure spiritual milk. So spiritual milk is these words that we're going to take on. So that by it, you may grow up in your salvation. Remember one of the biggest things we're looking at from reading this book is our salvation. And I say to everybody, you are going to look for your salvation yourself. You cannot hang on anybody else for your salvation. What are the things that will make you become what God wants you to be. It's you that can create that. Nobody else can create it for you. So, he starts to explain in abiding in God's word. That's one of the things we need. So there are more Bibles in print today than ever before. But a Bible on the shelf is worthless. You might say to yourself, oh yeah, look, I have a Bible too. I have a very big one. It's here. But just putting it up on the shelf without using it is absolutely useless. It's like any other book that you just put on the shelf. Many believers are plagued by spiritual anorexia, he said, or starving to death from spiritual malnutrition. Sean sure knows how he, to use his words. Spiritual anorexia. You know when somebody doesn't eat at all, and then all that happens is you start losing weight and losing weight and losing weight and they actually it's not just not eating it becomes an illness because most times they look in the mirror and they think they're extremely fat and then you say could you eat no i'm very fat and so it's a mental illness so he's saying that most believers are plagued by that they look in the mirror and they think they are they're fat because they're thinking i have a bible so i'm okay i don't need to do anything with it and starving to death from spiritual malnutrition. So when you don't eat, you starve. And that's, you're lost. You're lost in the sense of, um, there's nothing, you're not feeding yourself spiritually, and so you're just walking around, but there's nothing happening to you in life. So to be God's child, feeding on God's word, must be a priority. So as a child of God, feeding on God's word is a priority, and Jesus called it abiding. So he said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly a disciple of mine. If you abide, abide is be with it. Take it on. Listen to it. Take it. Receive it. Abide with me, O oh Lord. So in the 
in day-to-day -day living, abiding in God's word includes three activities. So he's trying to explain to us now what this abiding is all about. The, number one, I must accept its authority. So the Bible must become the authoritative standard for my life and the compass that I rely on for direction. So we need the Bible to lead us in direction where we're going. The counsel I listen to for making wise decisions. So if we take on the Bible, it will help us because we take it on as the authoritative standard. That's the standard by which I should live. That's what he's saying. It should be the compass that directs me in my life's journey. It should be the counsel that I listen to for making wise decisions. And you know, like when you go to court and you have the judge and you have the lawyers and the solicitors and they, they, they come together and they come up with a decision on your behalf. That's a counsel. So he's saying the Bible becomes that person for me to make wise decisions. Evaluating everything. So the Bible should be that benchmark that helps us to evaluate life. The Bible must have the last word in my life. So these are all the things he's advising us. Because if we rely on the Bible's counsel, which is telling us, remember, is the is the hope, is the direction, is the is um, everything that that we ever thought about. It gives us change, um, a change in life. It frightens the devil. It causes miracles. It gives us character. It transforms our circumstances. It brings us joy. If it's gonna do all of that, we need to give it the full authority to do that for us. And many of our troubles occur because we base our choices on unreliable authorities. That's what causes our problem. We base our, um, our choices in life on unreliable sources. Remember when we say, what is creating? What is feeding our thoughts? And so if we have the wrong places to go and search for, for information to feed the way we think, which then becomes the action that we take on, then obviously we are getting it from the wrong source. And that's what then causes our problem. And I remember when I was watching Bob Proctor in one of his videos, he says the problem we get is we end up going to our neighbor to ask questions for things that we need when we're in trouble. And meanwhile, our neighbor has no clue what we're talking about. You look at your neighbor, you find that he hasn't done anything in his life. So why then are we going to our neighbor to ask for answers for something that he has no knowledge about. So now he's trying to explain to us the places we go to for, for our choices. And these are the unreliable places. He says our culture. We look at our culture to give us answers. And what do we do? We say because everyone is doing it. That's why we're looking at our culture. Everyone in our culture is doing it. And I had this heated argument with someone on YouTube telling me because I wear a blonde wig, I'm given the wrong impression. Why? Because the culture has assumed that a colored wig is not good enough for the black culture. We've taken on that. We've accepted that mentality. Um, a colored wig is wrong for black people. And so now I should look at my culture to guide me on how I dress. But you can see that I dress differently all the time. That's what gives me joy. That's the personality that I am. And so why should I rely on my culture to dictate how I should dress? And this is why when we, there's a video we have to on the channel where we are braiding a Caucasian hair and is the most commented on video that we have because we've been told that braiding is not for the white culture. So this person who is white and wants braids cannot wear braids because the culture says it's not for her. And my question is, at what stage was these rules written down or these standards put in place? Who put them in place? So that's the question we have been asked here because if we are turning to culture to dictate how we think, that's what's making us fall down. That's what's putting us down. That's what's bringing us to the wrong places. That's what's making our life not make sense. We look at tradition because we've always done it that way. That's the reason we gave. 
and so you find something is really wrong it's not that way it shouldn't be done that way but because it's always been done that way there was an example i read somewhere a long time ago and i couldn't remember can't remember and this man said he had to dig deep into history to find out when that tradition started and he found that it was just someone's decision at the time everybody now followed it until today they were still doing it and he had to ask but this doesn't make sense why are we still doing it? oh because it's always been done that way we need to start asking questions because the answers are in the bible it says everything we're looking for is there so why are we relying on unreliable sources it says reason is the other source we look at it makes sense so it's logical so in your head it's logical and so i can't look at it any other way another one is it, we look at emotion it feels right you know what i'm really thinking this is the right way i feel it and so we need to go outside these places to find answers to the issues we're dealing with and all of these four are flawed that's what he's telling us they're all flawed and what we need is a perfect standard that will never lead us in the wrong, wrong direction. So that's a big message here. We shouldn't be relying on sources that are so unreliable to create what fits our thinking. And then our thinking then becomes our action and our action then becomes our life. And then we end up going the wrong direction in life. So do you see how a little journey we started 22, 24 days ago is beginning to mature because we started from not knowing why we took this on. But it's making sense now. If nothing else, to know that the sources we've been going to for answers are the wrong places. I think we've achieved quite a bit. You see, only God's word meets that need. Only God's word meets that need. And I, I showed you where I had all these verses written here. And this is just me writing this little bit. Not to talk about when I actually took time to read the Bible from page to page, which he's going to talk about. The Solomon reminds us, every word of God is flawless. And Paul explains, everything in the scriptures is God's word. All of it is useful for teaching and helping people and for correcting them and slowing them, um, showing them how to live. So everything in the scripture is God's word. And all of it is useful for teaching us how to live. And I remember that passage in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word is God. So everything God tells us in the Bible is real and is life. And he gave an example in the early years of his ministry. He says there's a man called Billy Graham. He went through a time when he struggled with doubts about the accuracy and authority of the Bible. So this man was struggling with the accuracy of the Bible. One moonlight night, he dropped to his knees in tears and told God that in spite of confusing passages, he, that he didn't understand from that point on, he would completely trust the Bible as the sole authority for his life and ministry. One day he just realized, because like most people who don't believe, they go, oh, in one place the Bible says this, in another place it says that. But you will know from every circumstance you're dealing with what that passage is trying to say to you. And so he, in the end he changed and he was blessed with unusual powers and effectiveness. The most important decision we can make today is to settle the issue of what will be the ultimate authority in our life. So that's a big question for us. We need to find out now. Is it going to be based on our culture, our tradition, our reasoning, our emotion? Or are we going to just look up to the Bible for direction whenever we're lost? And for me, it's always the Bible. Because before I chose to pick up this book, I had started that journey already and it did make a lot of sense to me. Everything I was picking up, whenever I felt funny about something, I would just go and find a way I'll find that in the Bible. And the good thing with the one I have is they have various chapters. You could find a good Bible that does that for you. You see that 
and so it breaks it down to areas when you are in this kind of issue the kind of um, places you look at look at that hospitality um, iniquity so most Bibles do that they break it down so that all you have to do is just go to the back first look at what you're experiencing at the time it gives you chapters it gives you verses and you go into that and then you read it and it answers your issue so you have that choice either you're going to rely on culture and tradition and emotion and feelings or you're going to look up to the ultimate source we should decide that regardless of culture tradition reason or emotion we choose the bible as our final authority and i'll say as our only authority as well determine to first ask what does the bible say whenever you want to make a decision on an issue ask yourself this issue what would the bible have told me about it resolve that when god says to do something you will trust god's word and do it whether or not it makes sense or you feel like doing it so most times and i know i'm also one of those and the thought will come into my head do it this way and i'm still wondering why why should i do it this way but you remember one of the chapters where it said god wants us to leap first he wants us to make that first move because once we've made it then he will bless it but he's not going to just bless you doubting because that doubt is what's stopping you and so when you jump just he says to you go do it and then you do it then he blesses it so you have to stop doubting and, and learning to trust God's word and do it whether or not it makes sense to you or you feel like doing it. Adopt Paul's statement as your personal affirmation of faith. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. So anything that the prophets are written in the Bible, he just agrees with it. Doesn't want to argue with it. I must assimilate it's truth and that's number two remember he was explaining to us that he has different ways of seeing it in, in today's living abiding in God's word includes three activities so number one was I must accept its authority I must assimilate his truth and so it's not enough just to believe the Bible I must fill my mind with it so that the Holy Spirit can transform me with the truth so the Holy Spirit abides in all of us. But once we fill our mind with it, remember the word, fill the mind. I have to note that down. Fill the mind. Because filling the mind is what creates that thought. So when you think, your mind first has to be filled with something. And that's a big question I've been asking myself since. Where does that feeling come from? Where does that information come from? Because remember the book I, taught, I talked about the other time, Think and Grow Rich. It's a book that every millionaire out there has read. I have read it too, but somehow it hasn't made any sense to me yet. And that's what the issue is. Where are my thoughts coming from? That's a big question we should all ask ourselves. What is feeding our thoughts? Because it's the thoughts that will lead to the action, and it's the action that will change our life and make us what we are dreaming of or what God has said we should become. So the Bible, um, it says it's not enough just to believe the Bible. It's not enough to just believe it. But we also, I must fill my mind with it so that the Holy Spirit can transform me with the truth. So the Holy Spirit in me will be the one guiding me with these thoughts that are already in my head and then tell me this is what makes sense out of it. He said, there are five ways to do this, to allow these thoughts to fill you. You must receive it. That's number one. You have to receive the, the message. Number two, you have to read it. We have to read it. And number three, we have to research it. So we've been given a thought, um, a thought or a passage, we research it. Number four, we must remember it. Which is why it says we should meditate. Remember, meditate on this passage. And number five, we should reflect on it. And so a thought is enter your head, you read it, you received it, you researched on it, 
you are remembering it, then you must reflect on it. And so receive God's word when you listen and accept it with an open, receptive attitude. With an open, receptive attitude. Your attitude should be ready to be, to allow that to come in. This was a huge one for me because he now went to explain to us what he means by receptive attitude. Parable of the sower. If you are, if you are, if you are conversant with the Bible, parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is a good example of how our receptiveness determines whether or not God's word takes root in our lives and bear fruits. So, you remember the parable of the sower? Jesus identified three unreceptive attitudes. Remember, we're talking about receptive attitude now. In the parable of the sower, Jesus picked out three unreceptive. They are not ready to take it on. A closed mind was one of them. And who was that closed mind? Closed mind? Is the hard soil. Remember, this sower brought the seeds to sow, and he just he just spread he spread the, the seeds across the land, and some fell on the hard soil, some fell on um, the shallow soil, which had nothing underneath. The shallow means it's just a little bit of soil, just a little bit of um, sand, nothing much, and some fell on the soil with weeds. There were weeds in that soil and some fell on the fertile ground. So these four sets of seeds create something in our life. It means something in the sense of our <coughs> attitude to life. And I tell you, I have never been so excited reading this. It says we must consider carefully how we listen. We must consider carefully how we listen. This is so important because we don't listen. Most of us do not listen. Now we've got this whole book that we're reading and carrying on. And I'm sure there are some people who probably just not get one word that I'm saying. 